So let me. All right. Welcome to our September Lunch and Learn. Today is actually a very special Lunch and Learn because we normally have one speaker, but today's Lunch and Learn, we have a duo and Joanna Tivig and Peter Monkhouse. They are both based out of Canada, I believe Toronto area, and uh, both are seasoned uh, leaders when it comes to Agile, when it comes to leading teams, uh, Joanna is a past organizer for Toronto Agile Conferences. She's a board member of uh, Part of Honor Toronto. She's a best-selling author uh, with Peter. Their book is uh, Gen P, New Generation of Part of Owners Who Care About Customers. And as far as Peter, he's been uh, a volunteer with PMI for 25 plus years. He has 40 plus years of experience leading teams and he's a, a keynote speaker. Again, he's a co-author of the book, uh, Gen P, New Generation, Part of Owners Who Care About Customers. So with this short introduction, if you guys wanna know more about them, you can go on our website, look at the event description and you can also find them easily on LinkedIn. Um, but I will send their LinkedIn uh, uh, links to you so you can follow up if you need to connect with them or if you have other questions you can reach out to them there as far as questions you can ask questions along the way you don't have to wait for the end of the presentation they both agreed to take questions and i will monitor the chat for any questions uh, but please just go ahead and jump in or type it or if you're shy you want to DM me your question, I will ask it for you. Um, as far as PDU, this event is for one PDU. At the end of the meeting, I will send you instructions for um, the survey and I will um, ask you to report your one PDU for this event. And all of that will be in the uh, post event email that you will all get. You need to probably change Without further screen. ado, I wanna just go ahead and turn it over to Joanna and Peter so they can talk to us about project, product management, acts of leadership. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Florence. And we're pleased to be here with you in the Central Illinois chapter. Um, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. So as Florence mentioned, we're a small group, so I'd like to make this very much interactive. So please, if you have any questions, or anything, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat, raise your hand. Um, the joys of having two presenters along with Florence is that hopefully if you do, someone will be watching and will catch very, very quickly. So um, there we are, that's a picture you saw coming in, Joanna and myself with our emails if you need to get a hold of us. But let's go on and talk about what we're going to do today. So we're going to talk about product owners as leaders, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Then we're going to move in to explain an acronym we adopted called ACHIEVE. And we'll talk, go through each of the acronyms to show how each of these letters will be an item of leadership from the point of view of product owners and product managers to help you, as even as project managers, to help you deliver your products to your organization, deliver value to customers and benefits to your organization. We'll wrap up with five takeaways. Although I show here we have a Q&A session, as I said, we'd like to kind of, instead of saving them all to the end, take them throughout, but we'll save a few minutes at the end if there are any questions. So here's some of the outcomes that we hopefully will be able to uh, share with you and get you familiar with. So examples of how product leaders can inspire their product development teams, which include project teams, demonstrate the key characteristic leaders have to achieve success. Of course, achieve will be an acronym. And of course, identify five takeaways for leaders to deal with the volatile environment in the post-pandemic world we are entering. At least I hope it's a post-pandemic world that we are entering. Okay, with that, Let's just dive right in and um, give you uh, more of an explanation of this, uh, achieve and dive into them. So over to you, Joanna. Thank you. And um, 
Um, hello, everybody. I'm I'm so happy to be here. Like as we discussed, um, it, it's nice to be able to meet virtually because this is an opportunity for us to get to know each other. So um, as uh, Peter mentioned, we will uh, touch on achieve a lot today. So we'll go through each of the components of achieve because at the end of the day, what we thought to have with this achieve was figure out a recipe for success in order to achieve success as a leader. I hear it. And, and our focus, is there a question or? Sorry, I thought I heard something. And um, the, the whole intention here was to uh, focus on product owners um, because our focus, Peter and I, um, is more on the business side. We believe that um, um, every successful transformation, things that we want to do in organization, they all start on the business side um, and, and more uh, so than the technology side, because technology, usually it's easy to do. You know, technology enables us to do things, but um, business um, is harder to do. So um, these components from an achieved perspective, so um, we, we will talk about agility and what agility means um, in the context of achieving success. We'll talk about the challenges organizations have and, and uh, we'll give you some examples and, and some direction in, in terms of how to actually remove those challenges that organizations have and, and just, um, be able to be successful and grow and uh, always develop. Um, the, the whole transition um, is happening from task to team. So the team is key component um, when it comes to transformations, when it, it comes to success. So we'll, um, we'll linger a little bit on the team and, and um, how we build high performance teams. Then um, we need a recipe for success, right? So iterations are always um, enablers for success, help us with the delivery. We'll also talk about um, ownership and how effective ownership is. So when we own something, what does that mean? Um, of course, everything needs to come from value and that's why the, the direct relation between what we actually deliver, what we um, what the outcomes of product projects are, which are the products and uh, the value of those products. And then at the end of the day, um, some tips for product owners to be successful in their jobs. And these tips can be applied for project managers as well, not necessarily for product owners. We see also transitioning, a lot of transitioning from uh, uh, project management to product management and project managers transitioning to product owners. So um, it, we can all learn from, from this. So next slide. So we'll start with agility for business. And this is important because um, um, agility has been seen by organization as the key ingredient for their success. So if you look at this and, and if we think about what, what is agility, uh, Business Agility Institute, they have a very comprehensive uh, definition there. You can see at the bottom of the page. And it's not just about how we work. It includes also behaviors. So one thing that you hear a lot in your organization is the idea of a mindset, building that mindset. And it, it all goes back to the culture. So it's the way we think, the way we look at what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And we say, we need to do it differently. We need to improve. We need to do it better and better. And, and it, it is just in us to have that will to, to become better at what we are doing. So the behavior is very important. It's one thing when you go to somebody and say, we have to do these things like we really need to change the way we work here. And when you have people that say, okay, I'm, I'm game, I'm, I'm ready to do it. Um, versus, you know, somebody will say, oh, good luck with that. Like uh, we've been trying to do this forever, but it's not working. So I don't want to be there. So again, like we want to nurture those behaviors that um, look for things, look for novelty, look for innovation. They want to do better every day. So we came up with this triangle, you can see there, you know, we need these ingredients. We need uh, the team with the right behaviors and the right culture, but we also need the organization. The organization is key to support 
uh, the team. So the leadership is important. Structure or how we structure the organization needs to follow you know, how we think. Because if we have a very hierarchical organization, but we expect everybody to work um, in a flat environment, but the structure doesn't allow them to do so, then things don't, don't work, they break. And then at the end is about the outcome. What are we delivering? Is the customer happy with what they are seeing? Because projects deliver something, deliver an outcome, right? So what is that outcome for the customer? Will they use it? Will they, they feel happy about it? Will they come back to purchase it? Will they um, come back to see more of it? And then this way the, the, the organization will grow. So if you go to the next slide, we have a question for you. So um, we use this tool called Mentimeter. Uh, you can put your phone, so you can put the, the camera on your phone next to the um, QR code here. So as you get closer to the QR code, it will take you to um, this link here, menti.com. And then you can see the voting code there. If they ask for the voting code is 69820635. And the question is here, like we are curious to find out from you if you're thinking about um, what your organization is trying to achieve. What do you think um, is the outcome, is the result of um, your, your organization? What are they hoping to achieve at the end of the day? Is it an organization that looks to have more flexibility or agility? Um, is it just agile implementations and execution? Is more of the status quo that you see there, you know, your organization just doing the same thing over and over again, they're trying to keep themselves afloat or basically, or you don't know. Um, sometimes we don't know because it's, it's so confusing what our organizations are doing. So we're trying to figure out, but it, it's not easy. Okay, so um, I can see more votes coming in as well. And it's actually spread. So um, it's, um, it, it's not one way or the other. It could be, you know, um, both. And one thing about Agile and just implementing Agile is that um, Agile should not be an outcome. Agile is something that will take us there, is more of an enabler. Like we use Agile as a delivery method to actually make sure that, you know, it gives us that flexibility, but the outcome should be different. The outcome should be something that we can tangibly say that we've done. You know, we created something that has value for who that that's that's for the organization to decide, is whether for the customer, is whether for the internal user. For another organization, you know, for the government is, you know, for the citizens and, and for not for profit is for people beneficiaries of, um, of what we are producing. So that's the one thing that it's important to remind organizations that we're using agile to get there to get to agility, but this is just a mechanism to get us there is not an outcome. Okay, perfect. So let's continue one more slide in terms of um, um, agility for business. One thing that you will see as we're trying to achieve agility, and, and this is, um, again, from different perspectives, we talked about business, product, team, and so on. Having that culture is very important. And I am stepping back a little bit as I go into organizations and I'm helping them transform. Because one of the things that I realized as I'm working with the teams is that if the team doesn't believe that there is something in it for them, if they don't look at this and say, okay, I will transform and I will do that because it means something to me, either as an individual or as a team. So the first thing that I want to do with the teams, find that common purpose, um, that common goal where everybody feels they are invested in what they are doing. So this is having that 
high performing culture where everybody moves in the same direction where they do they feel there is a spirit of a team there. Um, the other thing is very important to realize, and we have a um, couple of talks around that, is like, who's my customer? What am I doing this for? Sometimes we, we start projects, we are in the middle of it, and we don't even know who we're delivering for. So very important to understand the customer needs. The next part is like, how do we make those decisions faster? Because we stop sometimes and we get into that analysis paralysis where we cannot make decisions and we cannot move things forward. So having agility means that we are able to make those decisions faster. That whenever there is a question there put on the table, it's better to make a decision uh, uh, than not making a decision at all. And then try to continue and experiment and learn as much as possible. We keep talking about continuous learning so it's all about that. We learn as much as possible and we improve from there because we don't know, like we, we are in this, you know, with all the experience and all the things that we've done, but we know that every project is unique. So we do need to learn as we go and then adapt from there. So now Peter, I'll pass it to you to talk about Crash the Challenges. Thank you, Joanna. And you know, the challenges that we face today seem to be very, very large, right? Organizations are <clears throat> larger, they're more complex, they've got lots of integrated parts that come together, and there's many dependencies, which makes them hard to be flexible. So, you know, we think about organizations and, you know, the, some of the challenges they have, as Joanna talked about already, this idea of culture, the way we do things around here. I mean, is a culture set up for the organization to be successful, or is it still rooted in some historical values that are no longer relevant in today's world? Now, Joanna mentioned cult structure as well. So is the structure of the organization set up for product delivery um, appropriate for the, for the products that the organization's delivery, or is it set up for some sort of hierarchical control structure to manage and not really focused on keeping delivering value to the customer. What's the focus of the organization? Is the focus on achieving the organization's strategy or is it focused on other, act, other activities which are not are tangential to the strategy and not staying focused on the strategy? Where we come in as project managers, how about execution of the strategy? Are we delivering or executing products? Are we able to develop products that deliver value to customers on time, on budget, on scope, right, on quality. So what's our project management maturity? How well can we deliver their products to our customers and to continue to enhance them with additional features to deliver value? And then last, but change. Are we in a, working in an organization where we're able to change, to change with the changing environment of new technologies coming in play? <clears throat> React to, our competitors as they show up and, and maybe issue new features and new products, right? Are we able to change? Not only are we able to change, but are we able to help our customers change as well? So these are some of the challenges that we have. And I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about this sort of unique world that we're in today. There was a, um, a book written uh, a couple of years ago about the age of discovery, the new renaissance. And a couple of um, authors, um, Katana, and I can't remember the other name, talked about how there's some parallels with what's happening in today's world with what happened 500, over 500 years ago with the invention of the printing press. And it was all around knowledge dissemination, right? So before the printing press, you had to handwrite books and then they're very limited. Not everyone could read, not everyone could write. So very limited with the knowledge, and you have to rely on oral history to share knowledge. Then the printing press came, right, which made knowledge much more readily available. It was easier to mass produce books. It was you could put them in libraries when everyone could get access to them. But in 1992, we had the well, in the 90s we had the intervent, invention of the internet, which suddenly made it easier for us to publish books or to publish information 
on the website and to make it available to anyone. So this is causing a, quite a disruption from the technology and the new way of which um, we can address people. Oh, I talked about competitors. Well, it used to be a competitor you could was just the shop down the street or the 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 tradesperson around the corner from where we live. Now our competitor can be anywhere in the world. You know, it's wonderful as Joanna and I are working in UGMP and have our book that's on Amazon. We're selling it to anyone around the world. They just have to click on Amazon and poof, there it is. So we have that challenge that we have with new technologies that are coming into our product, right? And technologies are disruptive. We have the challenge of diversity, diversity in the different cultures, uh, the different uh, backgrounds that our people have, whether it be having multiple four generations in the workplace, whether it be having people who've emigrated to our country that bring a different set of values that we have to integrate or because of technology selling to customers around the world who have different cultures and different expectations that we have to deal with. So the diversity is wonderful because it can open up more markets for us and more opportunities, but it can be very challenging. And then we have new business models coming in. Companies like Uber or Airbnb, who suddenly have introduced new business models maybe taking advantage of technology, maybe just challenging the ways things have always been done that are also disrupting our world today. So this means our products have a lot of challenges that they have to address from these three forces. And you know, maybe there are others that you can think of as well, but this also creates opportunities if we're willing to change, if we're willing to adapt and restructure our organization, and most importantly, if we're willing to live, listen to our customers. Okay, Joanna, let's go on to H. Perfect. So we talked about the team and the importance of the team. And one thing that I can tell you from experience is um, I never had to micromanage anyone in my entire career. And I've been, you know, leading teams of hundreds of people because I gave them the, the support that they needed. And then I just let them be independent and self-sufficient and organize themselves. So one of the key things that I find from my experience, the more you spoon feed people and the more you give them and the more you handhold them, the more they expect you to do so. And they will never grow into the role that they, they have. When you give them the independence, when you let them decide, make decisions, uh, feel that they have the power to make those decisions, they have the power to actually self-organize and, and become leaders and, and rotate the leadership uh, within the team, you will see how they grow, how they become the leaders of tomorrow, how they, they flourish basically, and the teams start to, to jive very well, start to work very well. So that, that's basically you know, something that you may want to consider. The other thing is like having that common purpose and the shared goals, as we talked about, just deciding on what that is uh, in for them and um, how they can reach to that. I use um, a Team Canvas uh, template. So I can either do it with words or you can do it with stickies. You can have fun with the team. But let them identify what's that purpose, you know, usually represented by a heart, you know, in the team canvas that they have, and they will always go back to that when they have issues. Um, being accountable for what they do, how you, you raise that accountability in them is by giving them that commitment. So by empowering them to make decisions, they will feel accountable. So it's one thing when Florence comes to me and says, Joanna, do this. And I look at it and say, oh, oh, I, I, I don't know. I'm not really feeling how I do it, but I'll do it because Florence will ask me to do. And the other thing will be when I go in there, I choose it because I know I'm capable. I know I can do my best so I can be accountable for the work that I do. Respectful, like we work in teams most of the day. So we, we work uh, at office more than we spend the time at home. So we really need to make sure that we, we have respect for each other. And then with respect comes trust. So trusting each other and covering for each other and understanding our weaknesses and strengths is something that again, will fortify that team and will make it more high performing. 
So the next slide is showing uh, basically like a shortened version of the Tucker's development model for the teams. But you can see here, you want the teams to grow. If you see that the team is just in the forming and you know they're doing pretty well, but um, they identify this common purpose, but um, basically there, there needs to be more there. There needs to, to be more of that, the, the performance part. Um, just make sure that you introduce maybe some, uh, some um, uh, KPIs, key performance indicators for, for the team to feel that they are going into the right direction. Uh, one other tool that I use is the retrospective. So every week doing a retrospective with the team and seeing how they've been doing and seeing you know, what they need to work on, that will grow the team as well. You'll get to the point where they recognize, oh, I have to do this. Nobody will have to tell them uh, what, where they will need to improve because they will recognize where that improvement needs to come. So Peter, back to you for the iteration. Okay, thank you, Joanna. Just a pause here, maybe before I start on the I. Um, any questions so far? Any comments anyone would like to share? I have a quick comment. With virtual teams, though, I think honing the team is, is uh, it's not like it's impossible, but it's just um, more challenging. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say more challenging. So I've been working, of course, like everybody else for the last two years. And I think that um, what I've seen with this touch point, so you need, you need better check-in system. So as I mentioned, you know, the retrospectives are good. They bring people together. So once a week, everybody should come together to actually reflect on the week and what's happening there. They don't have to be long. They can be, you know, like half an hour. Another thing that we do, we do the daily stand-ups or the daily check-ins just for us to figure out what, what's happening. And once a week, we do like a fun uh, daily stand-up. So where everybody doesn't talk about work, we talk about something else just for us to build the relationship with the team and understand that there is, uh, you know, a life outside work. So these are things that you know you can encourage the team to to do more, to check in, to reach out. And I think what I've seen people are more comfortable reaching out on Teams, for example, or on Zoom or whatever technology you're using. You know, they send you a chat and they say, "Hey, you know, I'm having an issue here. Is it possible that I can call you for two minutes?" And and I can see that you know give. give give them the door, open the door for them and say, I am here. You know, anytime you have a question, come, come to me and ask the question because then they feel, they feel safe to come in and ask those questions. I know it's harder, but it's, it's doable. Mm -hmm. How do you, you start the conversation where you want to change your like weekly briefing from all business to you know more like what you were saying like once a week you do something where you get to know people better because I think we're starting to get farther apart instead of closer together right now yeah there was a time when I think there was everybody was complaining about the work and how how tired they felt and they said well you know instead of having this stand up can we just not have it at all, you know, once a week? And we said, okay, let's not have it. And then they complained, they said, oh, you know, I think we miss it, but we need to put a different spin to it. So this is where this idea came of having just one session where everybody would do, we talk about something in their life. So they actually came up with it. So if you open the floor and, and, and read the, the room, as they say, and, and see what they want, Everybody, like together, will, they will come to that conclusion that they need something else. Um, maybe try to do an exercise with them. I, we had, you know, we tried something like we did uh, virtual painting uh, for an hour, or we did um, all this, um, you know, two truths and a lie, uh, all those games um, that can relax people, especially if you have people from different cultures, different countries. So they, they feel that they are part of, of the team and, and they having fun. So they starting to relax and then they, they feel more engaged. 
There's a chat here from Cynthia about how do you structure the weekly stand-ups? Joanna may let you take that one. Yeah, so the, the weekly, the, the daily stand up. So we have daily stand ups and weekly retrospectives. So the weekly retrospectives, um, usually they are run, they are facilitated by one of the team members. So they have to announce themselves that they will facilitate. So uh, we do uh, different techniques. So if you search for te retrospective techniques, you will find on Google, you know, hundreds of techniques to do retrospective. So every week we try something else. On the daily standups is basically all about um, Roblox. So who has a Roblox uh, uh, um, and, and some issue that they want to raise. And, and usually it is, oh, I, I, I have this problem. I need to talk to so-and-so to resolve it. And somebody will say, oh, I have that problem as well. So why don't we connect? And they connect uh, offline. So the standups are maximum 15 minutes. So it's just in the morning for us to figure out, you know, how we'll, we'll structure our day and what we need to do, the support that we need. Um, and the weekly one is for us to reflect on the week, to say, oh, remember when we had that issue, that issue had that outcome, and then everybody can know about it. And then, you know, if that issue comes up again, everybody will know the, the answer and they don't have to speak. Thank you. And I think Ingrid made a good point here that she feels that uh, the virtual teams puts everyone on an equal footing. I would say as a leader, it's important that you remember that some people may reach out, as Joanna described, more frequently than others. So as a leader, you have to make the effort to reach out to those and just, you know, whether you start off with a quick chat to say, how are you doing today? Or something maybe, or, or ask them to you know, have a quick call just to reach out, even if there's nothing to talk about other than see how they're doing, because you've got to make sure they feel part of the team. They're not being isolated. Some people don't want to bother others, right? They, they're not going to do that on their own. So you as a leader have to help them out and understand that they can. Yeah. And, and I never complain about people reaching out. So I'm always available. So um, no matter how how much effort that would be, this is your team. And like anything that, you know, your family or anything that you want to take care of your garden, you need to nurture them. If you don't nurture them and if you don't spend time with them, they won't bloom. So that, that, that's the time well spent with your team. Okay, great discussion, but let's move on. Um, not to say we want to leave teams, they're very important to mention. The other thing we, that Joanna and I really feel very strongly about and, and put in our book is that as you're developing a product, you need to take an iterative approach to do it. Uh, gone are the days where you can sit back in isolation and develop the product and have a big launch, here it is, and then just forget about it. Right? You need to do this as an iterative way so that you can get feedback, but also adapt to the challenges that I talked about earlier. So we generally will look at this as an approach where you have an idea, you want to make sure that it's going to deliver value, solve a customer's problem, then you come up with a solution. Now, you may start testing that by using things like prototypes or proof of concept as you go along, but ultimately we're trying to get a minimum viable product. What is the minimum number of features we can put in the product to deliver value to the customer? Right. And we want to be able to launch that and then get feedback from our customers for them to be able to tell us whether or not it's delivering value or not. If it's not delivering value, then what's missing? What can we do to adapt? Trying to minimize our investment to get to the MVP so we haven't wasted a lot of money building features that no one wants or doesn't perceive any value. As we go through our analysis of the market, our MVP, we're going to build a product backlog, a list of features and functions that we would like to add into our product. As we get a minimum viable product that's actually delivering value, then we can take feedback from our customers to plan out future iterations where we can pick the features in our backlog delivering the most value, build, define them, build them, and then release them and continue this cycle over and over again 
always adding value, always adding things to our product based on customer feedback. Now this is you know, done, we have to promote our product as we go along, we have to make sure we have sales channels to sell it and so on. And that will continue. And you know, hopefully as we continue to evolve and adapt our product, we can continue to deliver value, we can extend the product life cycle. But ultimately we may have to sunset or exit the market with our particular product. But you know, as things are changing, especially as things are changing rapidly, we feel it's important that organizations come up with an approach to continuously look, get feedback about their products, continuously find ways to invest and adjust their products, maybe removing some features, adding new features as we go along. And in fact, Apple on the iPhone has done a reasonably good job as we're now on iPhone 14. So every year they have a new release, adding new features to their product, giving us solving problems that we have or problems that we don't know we have until they give us a solution to how we can move forward. So really important that we think about these loops as we continue to develop our product. So as project teams, as we're delivering our product, you know, this is where we're going to come in. We can use an agile or iterative approach on our developing the product, or maybe we'll, we'll step down for a while and then come back, but always look at this idea we're continuing to invest in the product. So I mentioned feedback as one of the, um, the key things that we have to get. And you know, we, there's a number of tools and techniques out there that we can use to get feedback. But the question is how to deal with it and what to deal and, and, and how to deal with it. So we've come up with this idea of the three R's of feedback. So first is when we get feedback, whether they be pains or gains from customers, we have to be able to relate. We have to be able to walk in our customers' shoes to try to understand the problem that they have and, and be able to relate to their experience. Right? So, you know, if we're uh, working on banking applications, then we should be using our own banking applications and see how well they work. Then once we can relate, we need to reflect, right? To reflect on what's causing this, this problem. Why is it happening? Right? To think of possible, um, to understand what the cause of that is. So then we can reshape the problem, or if you like, um, we, we add new features to close the gap and eliminate what the problem is, all along verifying this with our customer that did we have it right? Do we understand the problem correctly? And as the way we're proposing the solution, we're implementing the solution, has that solved your problem to deliver you more value? Okay, so now on to the next letter, E, Joanna. Yes, and it's actually the ownership part that um, we wanted to introduce to you and, and the whole idea about the product owner. So for those of you who don't know who the product owner is, is the actual owner of the result that we're creating in a project. So it's a new role in organizations. Uh, some organizations are still struggling with, the, with defining what the product owner role is. Um, sometimes they call it a business owner, sometimes they call it um, a, a technology owner or a solution owner, but is the, the idea of the ownership that we wanted to instill in, um, in our readers and our listeners and everybody that it, it's, it doesn't matter if it's solution, product, result, service, or anything else is ownership that matters. So when we own something, so if you think about your house or your car or your bike, we, we always have something you know, dear to us that we prefer to own because when we own it, we can actually take care of it. You know, we feel that we, you know, we want to protect it. We want to um, um, you know, show it off to, to everybody around us. You know, we have that pride. 
let me show you what I bought, you know, even if it's a dress or something like I own it, I, it's mine, you know, so, um, the, the, and, and you're passionate about it. So I, I'm passionate. I, I bought a bike recently, so I'm passionate about it. I, I feel like I want to put it, you know, uh, in the shed after I, I bike and, you know, not leave it in the rain. I feel that I want to show it off to my friends and, you know, Peter comes and I can show my bike to him and I can make decisions over my bike, right? I can decide to sell it. I can decide to give it to my kids. I can decide. So basically having that ownership, feeling that, okay, I'm invested in what I'm creating um, gives us different feelings, you know, makes us more into it. So that was the whole purpose of showing off that ownership. It gives us that connection uh, to the product or to the service, to the result, everything that we are building in a project. So related to that, and you know, related to the idea of promotion, we also wanted to link it to the four P's of marketing. So in the next slide, um, everybody knows about these four P's of marketing, and it's all about the product that that we are building. So if we have a product that has the right price, right? So um, um, we price it in a way that it's not too expensive, not too cheap. If you think about an Apple phone, because that's the one thing that I have on my desk here. So the, 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 the Apple thought about all those four P's of marketing, thought about the product, you know, it needed to be a consistent product needed to be saved, needed to have the right functionality and so on, needed to have the right pricing because if the pricing is, is right, it shows that you know it has also the right functionality. So um, you can see that uh, the, the Apple buyers, they keep buying these Apple phones for a reason because the, the, the phone is reliable, so then they can pay that price for it. Um, advertising it in the right place, so we need to find the right place when we do a certain campaign. So for toys, for example, um, as we um, launch a new toy, we always do it around Christmas time because we know that that's when a lot of people will buy toys for their kids, their nephews and nieces and so on. So um, if we miss that target, so I was talking to somebody at Mas Mastermind and they're preparing for, for Christmas and they said, oh, we are right underway with everything that's happening because if we miss Christmas, then the next window for us is in the summer. So this is something that you're really thinking, you know, I really have to get that place um, right. And then the right promotion. So investing in the advertising, investing in promoting it. And it goes back to that ownership. We do better promotion when we feel that feeling of ownership. So it means something to us. So that will resonate with the customers that we have. So Peter, back to you for the value. Yeah, so I've mentioned value already about delivering value to customers, right? So what is value and how does it work? So value and it's the, the I, sorry, I want to say two things at the same time. So value is part of the product but it's also what goes around the product. The additional attributes or features, the support of the customer is also part of the value that we deliver to the customer. And value will deliver benefits to the customer. And ultimately, they, when the customer gives, gets value, the organization will get benefits as well. So we can't just think of the product. We have to think of the whole support infrastructure. If they call for help, uh, you know, do they, do they go to 1-800 on hold or the, and I was dealing with one supplier um, last week who insists on having hours for, for customer support between nine and five, Monday to Friday. Well, I'm busy during that time. I can't, it's, I can't call them until the weekends or the evening. So it became very difficult. So it wasn't giving me a good customer experience. So the idea here is that when a for our products, we want to deliver value to our customers. And as I mentioned, our customers are going to give us feedback. Feedback that they, they get value, which may mean they reference, they refer us to friends, right? Or they give us good survey results or feedback that they don't give us value, in which case we need to learn from them. 
The other part that we have, as I mentioned earlier, is as we think about our product backlog, those features that we want to add in, we want to deliver those with the highest value first. So we have our product backlog, right, which is going to get input coming in from all sorts of sources into the backlog. The product owner is going to be the person that's going to be looking at that product backlog and trying to prioritize which are the features that are giving the most value. They're going to get input from other teams to help them. They're going to have input from the product team about clarifying how to implement some features as well. But those items need to be prioritized so that the highest value gets done first to so deliver more value to the customer sooner, gets the customer to address their problems, builds more loyalty. And then the lower items are done in later sprints, if at all, if they don't have any value. So the product owner's role here is making sure that they listen to the customer, they are able to identify those things in the backlog that are going to deliver value to the customer and making sure they get done sooner rather than later. Okay, Joanna, back to you for the final E in achieve. Yes, and, and let's bring everything together because we gave you all these concepts and all these things and you may say, okay, so what? Like I have all these things now in my head, but how do I do it? So that, that's basically the slide that brings everything together. And, and this is where we thought that, you know, we want to incorporate everything and, and, and leave you with something on the how. How do I do all these things and be successful is what I do. So first of all, keep that product thinking. So if you think about product, if you think about outcomes, if you think about what you are actually trying to do, trying to achieve, you will do better because then you, you, you will link, like Peter said, value to the customer. Like I'm, I, I have a customer, I can envision my customer. I can create that persona for my customer. I can actually know what I can offer to them so then they can be happy. The customer satisfaction is key because we don't understand, you know, in the whole mechanism, sometimes we work in risk management, for example, and we, we manage projects in risk management. We don't understand that everything that we're doing there, the process that we're doing for the organization, they may impede us to work to actually satisfy our customers. So we always have to understand what customer satisfaction means for the organization wherever we work. So we can make that organization nimble so the organization can help the customer and can make them satisfied. So here you have some tools like the net promoter score. Ask your customers, you know, if they would be able to refer you to their family and friends. Um, be, be there for them, understand how much effort they're putting into interacting with you. Um, do customer journey maps, you know, where actually you would understand the behaviors and the feelings of your customer. The team collaboration is key, and I cannot emphasize more than I have, I hope. Um, open space is one of the exercises that you can do where you can open the space to your organization to actually have everybody collaborate. Um, there is um, also openspaceagility.org where you can visit and you can look at that to understand what it means. I've done th that exercise with, with uh, my organization at one point in time. It, 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 it's amazing to actually see everybody coming together and talking about what they are interested in other people and, and forming ideas for the organization. Use tools for collaboration. I know like in a hybrid environment will be harder, but try as much as possible to, to have those tools help you and, and not vice versa. You know, just, just implement a tool for the sake of implementing and then leadership. And, and the coaching component of it, if you go to the next um, slide, um, Peter, is very important because as a leader, you also need to be a coach for your team. And, and the idea of a coach, like when you have a coach for a team, a coach does something that is so important for that team. They are there for them to listen to and, and observe to see how the team is, is going and then drop those tips in there, you know, like from time to time to tell them, to tell the team, hey, you know, this is how we should be doing here. This is how we should be working here. So the coach as a leader, 
um, uh, a type of leadership style is very important. So try to play those hats in the different contexts and the different situations for your team. And for that, we have uh, also a mentee uh, question for you. Um, so if you think about yourself, which leadership style do you think you use in different situations? Or, or um, you use the most? So if you think about all those situations you've been in, what was the most used? Okay, servant is the most, you know, serving the team, being there, supporting the charismatic one. Perfect. The charismatic one is a, is a great leadership style in situations where you want to motivate the, the team. You want to make them, you know, feel that they can do it. They are enabled. They are empowered. So that's good. The same thing with the servant. I think servant and charismatic, they work hand in hand. And um, being there for the team is, is so key these days. I mean, we've been going through a pandemic. We, we, we needed leaders there for their teams, coaching. So um, I am myself a coach. So. Um, one of the things with the coaches that we have to, to think about is like a temporary job, right? So the moment the team is high performing, the coaches, you know, the coach's job is done. Um, so this, this is something that we want to keep in mind. We want that team to grow so they don't need us anymore. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so Peter, you can take it to, to the wrap up. Yes, so what we want to leave you with is five takeaways for acts of leadership. And as Joanna mentioned at the beginning, although we talk about this product owners in action, it can apply to all of us, right? So first is you know, thinking about delegation. As Joanna mentioned this, you want to be able to empower the team for decision-making, right? So this is part of what we need to do. Right, you want to make sure your team is not only empowered, but they're willing to be able to be creative and innovative and think out of the box. Right, so because you need to have creative minds to address the challenges that I talked about earlier. So, what are the five tips? Active listening. Remember, this is the idea you've given two ears and one mouth. You should use them in that proportion. So, listen to what your team says. Listen to what your customers say. Right. Start off by this, encourage them to share with you, right? And be engaged when you're having conversation with them. Don't be distracted about what's going on. You want to be able to drive the product forward or drive your project team forward to set priorities based on what is needed, based on what is going to deliver value to your customers, not what they want or not what someone else wants. You have to be focused. Right? You need to be focusing on delivering the maximum amount of value for every iteration of your product. So you have your project team focused on delivering the value they have. So another way of maybe politely saying this is eliminating waste, right? To make sure everything you're doing is going to be adding value. Promote. Now, you know, we don't have to be our aggressive salespeople, but we need to make sure that we are promoting the work that we're doing, the, the product, and how it's going to be unique and how it's delivering value to our customers. And make sure not only our customers are aware of that, but also the team that's supporting our customers, that they know how we're, how we're solving customer problems and how we're doing it well. And last, but certainly not least, is we have to continue to grow and learn. Right, you know, one of the great things about retrospectives is a way for the team to learn and to be able to do and do better next time. But we have to do that as individuals as well. We have to think about what additional skills should we add so that we can be deliver more value ourselves from ourselves 
to our organizations as we move forward. So with that, we have a few minutes left for questions uh, before we hit the top of the hour. So are there any additional questions that anyone has that you'd like to ask at this point in time? What have I got, three minutes? Pretty much, and I don't see anything in the chat. And you sent us a, re a retrospective link, Joanna? Yes, yeah, so this okay. is um, a funretrospectives.com. So you can find different ideas there on how to conduct these retrospectives, but there are other links available um, uh, as you Google uh, for sure. It, the whole idea is for the team to open up and have as much fun as possible. So I, I also use it as a means for, for the team to be relaxed. So if you use this fun retrospectives uh, idea, I find that you know team that the, the team is more willing to open up and, and talk about okay. the changes um, and also find the solution. So all these techniques are good because they give you an opportunity to reflect on the solution. Thank you for sharing it. And I'll make sure to have that in our email with the survey for today's Lunch and Learn. So with that, I just want to say thank you, Joanna and Peter, for saying yes to my request to bring you guys to Central Illinois. I learned a lot. I think this is my third time watching this presentation. Um, so I know as a product owner, this information is so relevant. So I personally got a lot of it from it. And I hope everybody else did too. It sounds like I would say yes, based on the comments and, and, and the thank yous. I would say we had a very uh, great lunch and learn today. To our CIC members, please check your emails or watch your emails. October events are up and more might be added. And certainly for November, we should, uh, I think I should be able to start populating events for November. Um, again, please uh, stay in touch, check your emails, open your emails and uh, go on our website and register for chapter events. Any last uh, parting words? I I think we're all done. Thank you guys. And I will Thanks. stop the recording. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, Ingrid, Ingrid. Ingrid has a question, if you guys don't mind. <laughs> um, Ingrid wanted to ask, how do you handle a PO who does not know the product? Um, basically a product owner who doesn't have the technical skills or the product knowledge, What's a, what would be your tip for that product the, owner? The person is a product owner and they don't- Yes, but they're not, I guess, fully versed in the product. Well, that, that, that's a problem. And I've seen that many in many places. So one thing would be to start educating that person. And, and the first question that I go in there and I ask them like, who's your customer? And start from there, start with the persona or the customer and start shaping that up. And the product will follow the persona. So the first thing would be to identify who are we building this for? Then I would add to that, I think Joanna has a cute story she shares many times of how she took over a team and it was a banking application. So she got them to go to the bank branch, right? To actually see experience as a customer. So, yeah. you know, not only start learning of them, but getting them, okay, go and buy the product and start using it mm -hmm. so that they can start ex having that experience of what the product is and how it's being used. Now, having said that, I realized that you know, some products that may not be possible for a person to go and buy and use because of the nature of the product, but then it's joint, then, you know, take them to a place where the product's being used so they can see the people using them and understand what it is. You know, I, I understand it happens. Maybe it's a new person coming in that has to learn, but hopefully that at least they're willing to learn and understand who, who the customer is and how the product, what problem has to be solved. Perfect. Thank you so much. And with that, we will stop here and I will stop the recording. See you guys next month. Thank you. Stay in touch. Bye, Take guys. Care. Bye.